if we were offered the option to choose to be here, would we? Would we choose existence over non-existence, consciousness, participation in this lumbering mass of flesh, skin, bones, ideas, manufactured steel, cement, hopes, and dreams? To swim amongst pain, suffering, loss, and sorrow? To live in a world where plastic wood, metal, and lead is composed into guns and bullets whose only purpose is to make the soup of ache we swim in all the more viscous? If this is the guarantee of the world you'll be born into, why be born at all? Did you choose to be born? Did you take part in the choice your parents made to, you know, make you? Did you provide informed consent? No, really, I'm, I'm serious. This is an important question. I want you to ask yourself if you chose to be here. Now, I'm sure someone out there will have a religious reason to say yes, so let me ask this question a little differently. Do you remember choosing to be here? Do you remember what it was like to not be alive before you were born? No. Your answer is no. The belief that it is immoral to have children, and all humans should abstain from procreating. That's what comes up when you look up antinatalism. And sure, if we stop procreating, there won't be any more humans. But is it really right to bring new life into a world that is filled with suffering? Is it moral when you know that if you don't, there won't be any new suffering? This might sound ridiculous at first, but when you really think about it, is it right to force something that doesn't exist to exist just to suffer? There's another argument for antinatalism, and it sits on the same premise as veganism. Consent. As I said before, an unborn child, hell, a sperm, and an egg cannot consent to being used to make a human. The result of that sperm and egg can't consent. Once the resulting human is old enough to consent, it's far past the point of no return. It exists, and now it must do with its existence what it can. In the world that we live in today, that is mostly suffering. And this line of thinking is actually pretty much pointless, since most people want to be alive. The world, in fact, isn't mostly suffering. 3.8% of the population have depression, which means that around 96.2% of people would have no reason to agree with this ideology. From the perspective of someone that's more or less depressed most of the time, it makes some sense until you think about it enough. Then it starts to fall apart. I mean, think about it. The unhappiness you need to feel for this ideology to even cross your mind is rare. Most people clicked off this video already because they thought I was crazy. Some didn't because maybe they resonate with my words. Sure, things are bad right now, but they won't always be. Change will come because it's inevitable. It's just a matter of whether we make sure it's the right kind of change, a good change. The first argument for antinatalism is one that can be pretty quickly dismissed. Antinatalism is essentially advocating for species-wide suicide, which goes against the point of humanity to begin with. We figure things out, we learn, and we grow, and we make things better for those around us. We try to, at least. To give up collectively is to rob ourselves of the opportunity to figure out the problems we're facing now, to get that smile on your face when you realize that, despite the odds, you figured it out. Vsauce described the human mind as something that was not an organ, but instead is the combination of all the human brains in the world. It's an ever-expanding organ of tissue and wood and stone and steel. All our minds together make up humanity's strength, communication, our ability to share ideas, thoughts, experiences, mistakes, and lessons, to make ourselves not lost in the ocean without a lighthouse to guide us, but for each of us to be a lighthouse, floating in the cresting waves, powered not by neurotoxic mercury, but by humanity's desire to thrive, to someday create a boat large enough and sturdy enough that we can all be free from the turbulent waves below a safety net we all provide for each other, each of us not lost but found in our own corner of a ship that'll never sink, because we each have a job to do, to do our part in making sure it never does. Having said all this, the second part of antinatalism is trickier, and the part that I think will always be valid, despite how frustrating it may be. None of us chose to be here. Most of us are fine with it, our parents made that choice, and now here we are. But some of us aren't fine with it. 
Some of us are deeply hurt and pained by our own existence, either because we're simply in pain and life is mostly suffering, or we're born into a situation where you were always meant to fail. Let's roleplay. You exist, and it kind of sucks. You're alone at the moment, stuck thinking about your life and what it means and what it might not mean. You feel like this is a pivotal moment for you. The choice you make now will decide how the rest of your life goes. Your outlook on existence from this moment on will determine your behavior, your choices, and the outcome of everything in your life up to this point. As far as I can tell, there are three basic choices you can make. One is the correct choice, no matter what. The second is one that I will never condone, but don't inherently judge either. And the third is the wrong choice. Making the third choice makes you a bad person. First, you could choose to do the best you can with the life you've been given. Exist. Make sure your existence is worth it. Do good deeds. Love people who are worthy of loving. Hate people only when they're deserving of hate. You exist, and you're going to do the best you can with that fact as you can. Second, you could choose to stop existing. Don't. But it is a choice that you can, but shouldn't, make. Countries like Canada actually have medically aided suicide for people whose lives would be filled with pain or would not be worth living. It's macabre and sad and goes against the idea that nobody should commit suicide, but it's a fact of existence that sometimes existing isn't worth the pain. Just as it's illegal to drive a car without a license, and it should be illegal to own a gun without a license, you should not commit suicide unless it's state-sanctioned and medically aided. I can't believe I'm writing this, honestly. I might be taking the subject too far and too deep, but I think it is something that needs to be discussed openly and honestly. I am not in any way condoning or advocating or romanticizing suicide. If you have thoughts of hurting yourself, you need to seek professional help in any way you can. Call the suicide hotline. In America, it's 988. Again, 988. I really don't want to upset anyone with this video. I just want to have an open and honest communication about existence. That's all I ever want to do, honestly. The third option, the wrong one is to make your existence everyone else's problem. Make everyone else suffer, all because you suffer. Be a bad person, all because you don't want to be here. Take everyone else down with you, so to speak. I know someone that chose that option. It can be a very complicated situation that leads you to the third option. Maybe you're somebody that has caused pain, hurt people, pretty much everyone you've ever known. You probably don't care, you probably have narcissistic personality disorder, or something. But deep down, you do feel guilty. Though you can't ever express it, you can't ever let anyone, even yourself, know that you feel guilt. So instead, you blame your existence itself. If only you were never born, you wouldn't be a bad person. You wouldn't have hurt people. But you're not in charge of your own birth, your parents were. So you blame them. You make it their problem that you're a bad person. It's all their fault they did the best they could to raise you. It's all their fault. I got sidetracked. Sometimes we hide from ourselves, use any blanket sheet of displaced accountability to hide from our own icy gaze. I think that antinatalism is another one of these ways of displacing accountability, just a way to blame the ever-rising and falling tides for our unhappiness with our place in them. Sure, you're allowed to be unhappy with the conditions of your existence. For a lot of people, it sucks to be alive right now. And from certain perspectives, people have so many reasons to be unhappy and depressed. But these things are no reason to decide humanity should no longer procreate. These are reasons to take a look at the world in front of us and decide to do something about it. I believe that humanity as a whole has incredible potential for the happiness of its members. That someday we will figure out how happiness can be evenly and abundantly distributed. That happiness doesn't have to be treated like a non-renewable resource, but an abundance that with the effort of the individual can be attained. We do not live in that world, however. We live in a world where wealth, power, and influence is hoarded at the top, and the scraps are left to drift down to the bottom. We should not all collectively give up on existence just because this is the case. We should strive for the world we all want to see, even if we might not be around to see it by the time it comes around. That's kind of the benefit of large humankind goals. 
an individual can chase it, do everything they can to make some small change, making that goal just the smallest bit closer. But this human will never lose hope or fear failure because they'll never experience the failure. They won't have the chance to. They won't see victory either. They'll die thinking that they guided humanity towards victory in whatever small way they could, but they can never truly know. I think having that kid is kind of like having that goal. You have a goal for humanity, something huge, somewhat abstract, but still theoretically attainable. It's kind of like a single human life. When your parents made you, they had no idea who you were gonna be. They had no idea who they were making. All they knew is they were making someone they'd love with all their heart. Someone they'd try to bring up the best they could, someone they wanted to be happy. Isn't it funny how abstract happiness is though? I don't think most people understand what it really is because it's not really something. It's a process, it's growth. It's just a ratio from warm to cold. The warmth of your lover's embrace, the warmth of your smile, the warmth of your bed after a long day. To the cold of your partner's cold shoulder, the ice in your glare, and the burning cold of heartbreak. All these things are weighed, and the ratio you get is how happy you are. The goal we should have for people is to feel as much warmth and happiness and love as they can without robbing others of their own. That's the goal, however likely unattainable as it is. That is the goal. So let's reach for it. Thank you for watching.